Hello everyone, I'm Forum BX257, your friendly neighborhood 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe tour reviewer. And as you know, the vintage G.I. Joe toy line ran from 1982 through 1994. So Hasbro actually had the very distinct challenge of really designing their action figure line to appeal to two different generations, both the people of the 80s and the very interesting trends of the 1990s. Now, I had just watched Dan Larson's top 10 list of worst G.I. Joe action figures, and he had actually pointed out that, accidentally, a lot of the uh, figures on that line are from the 90s. Now, that isn't really his fault. A lot of collectors generally tend to sort of skew towards the 80s. Many comments that I have are like, oh, well, you know, I stopped collecting in 86, or, oh, they sort of peaked in 1989. And, well, to be honest, that is a kind of a fair opinion. But, I would like to point out that some figures from the 1990s are actually pretty awesome, and you should really check them out. And you shouldn't really be bothered by the particular decade that they were made in. Now, in my list of top 10 1990s G.I. Joes that are actually awesome, you should probably understand that I'm not going to include the 1990 figures in here because I know that their they're, they're sort of pre-production lies in back in 1989 or before that. So these are really figures from 1991 through 94, which I think you should check out. And also check out Dan Larson's channel, Toy Galaxy, because he has a lot of nice little comedy skits from 1980s nostalgia from toys and shows. Honorable mention the 1993 Balcor Duke, whose Desert Storm inspired outfit is oh so close to being good, but just misses the mark. Actually, this figure is designed after the 1991 Hall of Fame 12 inch Duke, the first 12 inch G.I. Joe made since 1976, issued when Desert Storm was still relevant. Unfortunately, the 3 and 3 quarter inch version didn't get the detailed paint job, nor the interesting accessories. So at number 10, we have the 1992 Bulletproof. He has a few things going against him and still manages to make the list. He's a new character and the leader of a sub-team known as the DEF, Drug Elimination Force. And you'd think Hasbro would give him a blaring look at me color scheme or hip 90s kid friendly vibe. At most, he should look like a military police officer or a federal agent, but no. He looks way more like an infantry soldier than some of the Joe figures that were in the standard line. As for accessories, yes, all the sub-team figures had that gimmicky flashing missile launcher, but at least Bulletproof didn't need them. In addition to the gimmick, he also came with a helmet, attachable microphone, submachine gun, and backpack all in green. His green might still be a little bright for some collectors, but it's offset by brown digital breakup camo. Again, something we don't often see in the main line, which is supposed to be made up of infantry soldiers. Number 9 is a figure that doesn't sound too good on paper, but when fully assembled is surprisingly impressive. Say hello to Cobra's first official Desert Trooper, the 1991 Desert Scorpion. What took Hasbro this long to fill this environmental specialty on the Cobra side? Who knows? All I know is a yellow and dark brown dude with a comically large pet bug winds up looking decidedly badass when you give him a real cloth havelock, a thing on the back of a hat or a helmet that wards off scorching sunlight, a multi-piece gun missile backpack, and arm him with a pair of stubby wolverine claws. The figure also has a cool face mask that, by all rights, should have come on that year's snake eyes. The hole is definitely greater than the sum of the parts for this guy. At number 8 is the 1994 Roadblock, part of the Star Brigade sub team. Okay, I might be biased here as Roadblock is one of my favorite characters, but this version is pretty cool. Now, I know what you're going to say. He's wearing bright orange. Yuck. Putting aside the fact that pilot jumpsuits are often this color for visibility during recovery, there's another reason why you should respect his color choice. Look at these three previous astronauts. They're all wearing primarily white, a traditional spacesuit color, sure. Or is it? You know the Defiant and Crusader are the most memorable G.I. Joe spacecraft. Now, guess what's commonly worn by real space shuttle astronauts? That's right, orange. 
suddenly Roadblock's the only G.I. Joe astronaut wearing the correct colors. Speaking of colors, dig those jet black accents and black helmet with wicked red visor. That's always an awesome combo. As for accessories, okay, forget it. The goofy missile launcher is all he needs, if that. Use him as a pilot and keep the spare accessories in a junk drawer. Number 7 is the 1992 Talking Battle Commander's Cobra Commander. After a silver armored version in 1987 that most collectors associate with an imposter, and a bizarre drone equipped version in 1990 where you could totally see his face, oops, Hasbro returned to the enemy leader's iconic uniform, looking like the 1984 hooded mail away version, but done in comic accurate style and colors. There's no denying this is the last, best version of old Ragface there is in the vintage run. Okay, so you have to unscrew that comically oversized backpack which holds the sound mechanism, which in today's technology would be inside the figure, but the trade-off is a figure with a ball-jointed head with a meaner look in his eye than the 1984 Mail Away original, and boots. Yes, Cobra Commander finally wears full-on over-the-pants boots. Not those Napoleonic era footstrap thingies. And for a bonus, the sound box still works when detached from the figure. Number 6 is the lone driver to make the list, which isn't surprising seeing as in the 90s Hasbro pretty much dropped pack in figures with vehicles for all but the most expensive sets. Here is the 1993 Balcor Ace, pilot of the Ghost Striker X16. Actually, a repaint of the 1992 Battlecopter version, the drab olive green flight suit and black helmet seem very fitting to the realistic and modern design. He seems to be an example of the design and colors improving with each release, which is definitely not the norm. As fond as most collectors are of the 1983 spacesuit original, myself included, this final version of the character almost seems to be what should have been released in the first place. Especially when you put together all the other pilots of the early to mid 80s, this one fits in better. While not designed at the same time, the figure and realistic jet still complement each other very well, and most importantly, they've both aged very well too. Number 5 on the list is the 1991 Crimson Guard Immortals. Based on the original 1985 Crimson Guards, one of my favorite designs, I was a bit critical of this update at first. If this is an update and not a specialty variant, I'm still not sure. Other updates of iconic 80s characters made in 1991 have not fared very well. Cobra Commander, as stated before, Snake Eyes, Grunt, and others leave much to be desired. But all in all, I'm very impressed with what they've done with this guy. Practical body armor, a ton of cool storable weapons, and a helmet that makes more sense than the original. And one nice little throwback detail that Hasbro could have totally skipped out on but didn't? The elaborate Silver Crimson Guard patch on his arm. Yep, it's there, looking exactly as it did six years earlier. With so much change on this figure, he still gives off the feel of a ceremonial Crimson Guard, but with the benefit of added field combat equipment, so mission accomplished. At number 4 is a ninja. Yes, there is a ninja on my list. Let that sink in for a moment. Most viewers will know by now my hatred for wacky 90s trends in general, and the proliferation of ninjas during that decade in particular. But, well, just look at this guy. It's a 1992 Ninja 4 subteam Nunchuck. Having a lazy name among a team with lazy, bordering on insulting names, Nunchuck is possibly the best designed ninja ever. And yes, I'm including my favorites, the 1984 and 1988 Storm Shadows, in that statement. Nunchuck is everything I think a modern close quarters stealth combat fighter should be. He's wearing drab green with black camo and black accents with modern looking equipment stored in pouches. He even has a cloth havelock piece to emphasize the mysterious black wrapped head of his. Okay, in all fairness, he does have one drawback. 90 sub teams all had gimmicks and this figure was an integral spring action that made his right arm swing down. Good luck fixing him, since the figure was constructed without a back screw. Oh well, at least 90% of the figure is still freely posable. In a line that included fellow Joe Ninjas wearing yellow, bright blue, neon green and hot pink, Nunchuck looks like he's from a completely different series. And to me, that's a good thing, because if you really, really need a ninja on your military earth tone color G.I. Joe team, you finally have an option, and he's from 1992 no less. Number 3 is Stinky Diver. 
Oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Number three is the 1994 Balcor Navy Seal Shipwreck, who was a standard Navy sailor back in 1985. That's quite the upgrade for a second version of Shipwreck, but it's a good one. He looks great in the role of a scuba diver. The figure is all business too, with a dark grey wetsuit with black accents and silver rebreather unit. Unlike other iconic scuba divers, like the 1983 Torpedo and 1986 wetsuit figures, Shipwreck's accessories don't limit him to just underwater action. Yes, I know the weapon tree included with the figures from this year is generic, but I can't help think that this was planned. The obnoxious missile launcher is his only aquatic weapon, and the rest is very appropriate for storming a beach or boarding a Cobra ship. However, it's not just the figure that's great, but it's history as well. Before Robot Chicken made the standard for action figure stop motion parodies, there was Action League Now. Starting as a four minute segment on Nickelodeon Kids comedy variety show called All That in 1995, the concept migrated to regular comedy skit on the show titled Kablam from 1996 to 2000. The Action League was a bumbling superhero group consisting of action figures from different brands set in the real world, sort of. One of the most recognizable toy characters in the group was the cliched lone wolf, Stinky Diver, a barely altered 1994 shipwreck. How exactly Nickelodeon got away with this is baffling. Just as baffling as the Burger King giveaway, which is essentially a figurine for a copyrighted character that is an action figure from a different copyright holder. Hmm. The clock strikes two for 1991 Big Ben, the SAS Trooper. When I first heard of this figure, my immediate thought was, where are his stereotypical British details? Answer, nowhere. He's not wearing a black derby or Union Jack pattern shorts or carrying an umbrella accessory. He's designed through and through for cold weather, European theater, heavy infantry assault. The 1991 line was known for steering into neon colored gimmick weapon territory, but Big Ben looks like he was designed for the year previous when Hasbro was still trying to make their toy line about army men look like army men. As far as soldiers from other countries that have joined the real American heroes, Big Ben is the crowning example of getting it right the first time. The figure was released four more times afterward, virtually unchanged except for colors which remain muted. About the only gripe one can level against the amazing figure is his code name. That name is just lazy. His last name is Bennett, which forms the cute nickname involving the famous clock, Yawn. It's like a person who's never been to England came up with it. What other thing would they have come up with? The Beatles? London taxicabs? The Queen? Well, I guess we should be grateful they didn't okay any puns involving those examples. And finally, my number one choice for an action figure that collectors are missing out on if they snub 90s releases is the 1993 Balakor Headhunter Stormtrooper. Check this guy out. He was part of a cancelled second wave of figures in the Drug Elimination Force sub-team that Hasbro shoved into the Balcor main line. Australia still got him on separate DEF packaging though. The bad guys in Nancy Reagan's War on Drugs looked pretty goofy, almost like a focus group came up with those designs. Except for the Stormtrooper. No, this guy looks like a cool sci-fi bounty hunter with his dark colors, pops of gold accents, skull-like face, and spikes all over his upper body. This is one figure that didn't even need weapons to look genuinely threatening. While the weapons he did get were the generic tree most figures got that year, by some miracle they're molded in black plastic. Perfect for both this design and realism. Perhaps he would be on more people's radar if he had no association with the DEF line and was marketed as a new version of the Cobra Range Viper. While the 90s releases of G.I. Joe might be remembered for the awful neon colors, weird non-military designs, and cheesy gimmicks, at least some genuinely cool designs managed to sneak past those now dated trends. 